Well, good morning. Welcome to God's worship today. Um, I'd waited a little bit longer than when we usually get started with announcements because I know people come in late on fellowship dinner days and I see some cards uh, uh, driving in today. But boy, today is a, is a big day. It's, uh, it's Mother's Day. Uh, we're ordaining a new deacon today. We'll have uh, um, the Lord's Supper today. Uh, we're going to be having our fellowship dinner and uh, uh, men and uh, children. Um, we want to ask you to, uh, to serve our moms. Let them sit down uh, and enjoy uh, a meal today unhurried since they uh, serve us uh, throughout the, the, the whole of the year uh, most of the time. Um, in fact, before we do anything else, um, if you're a mom, I want you to remain seated. And everyone else, if you're able, please stand so that we can honor our moms. And I want to pray for uh, you moms. Uh, Father, thank you so much for the mothers that you have brought into our lives. Uh, Father, our own mothers and the mothers of our children and uh, people who have been mothers to us, so they may not be related by blood, have been mothers in Israel, so to speak. And Father, we ask that your blessing would be upon each of these moms. Bless them, Father, establish the work of their hands in um, the many hours and uh, days and resources that they have poured into their children. Bless them, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please go ahead and be seated. Um, See, we've got a few announcements today. Um, uh, Doug Sane and I, Elder Doug Sane and I, just got back from um, Presbytery. And I think that rather than give a report on that, because we've got such a full day, I'll send out a report of things to pray for. Um, I always look forward to going to Presbytery with, with Doug, though. I remember, I think it was 15 years ago, Doug, Doug drove. I always like it when Doug drives. And uh, do you remember this? We were coming back across the Point of Rocks Bridge from Maryland. And as you come around the corner there, there's a, there's a I think it's, it was an old storefront, but it's abandoned now, and vendors will set up there. And as we come around that corner, there was a sign set up. Somebody was selling kettle corn. And as we came around that corner, Doug literally came around that corner, skidded into the parking lot, and said to me, kettle corn, mind if I stop? <laughs> And uh, we still tell that story at, at my house. That was a, a, a great time. But um, that was a good Presbytery meeting yesterday. Of course, again, uh, oh, I was looking down the list here just to say uh, Happy Mother's Day. Somebody said it's, it's you know, boy, it was kind of cold today. You know, folks, that's why it's the month of May, right? It, it may be 20, maybe 90, may rain, may snow. We never know what it's going to be here. But... Um, You'll note uh, in your bulletins, we've got the, uh, the, the, the baby bottle uh, campaign benefiting Mosaic uh, Virginia Pregnancy Center that, uh, that we support, and uh, it's, those are uh, distributed. The idea behind those is that you take um, uh, your baby bottles and you put a spare change in them, and then, um, and uh, or dollar bills or checks. I don't know. Does anybody get change anymore? I don't know. I haven't used change in a long time. But uh, but anyway, and then return them by June the 19th. And this is a campaign that they do at the churches every year uh, in order to uh, to, to help uh, moms uh, who um, are finding themselves in a difficult situation, but uh, but want to keep their babies. They also have quite an extensive ministry to. Um, women who have aborted their children and are struggling with the with the guilt and the pain of doing that. And they have a, a a very meaningful ministry to that too, and they've got a men's ministry to the uh, to the to the to the fathers who have been involved uh, in all of those things. So pick up your baby bottle and uh, uh, look forward to participating again uh, in that this year. Um, there's a number of things here, but I'm just going to uh, to um, uh, highlight again that we need help with uh, Bethel Summer Nature Camp. It runs from June 20 to 24th. It's just in the mornings, just those five days, uh, and then it's done. Um, it uh, doesn't require uh, the preparation that Vacation Bible School used to. Um, it looks like a pretty uh, easy thing, but whereas our Vacation Bible School, when we had it before 
uh, the COVID pandemic hit, was declining in, um, in, in attendance. There's been a lot of interest in this, a lot of people who have uh, registered uh, from outside the church. So uh, let me encourage you to, uh, to help out with that. And you can see uh, Donna regarding that. Um, let's uh, turn our attention to uh, turn our attention to worshiping God, and uh, we'll just spend a few moments in meditation doing that. Please rise if you're able for the call to worship. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. And let us now sing the hymn of praise, O God, beyond all praising. to worship you. 
For we are reminded doubly this morning of just how unique and precious is this privilege of worshiping you. As we partake of the Lord's Supper, we see your matchless love for each of us as you took our sin upon yourself so that we might be redeemed through the righteousness of Christ. And as we prepare for the ordination and installation of our brother Craig Lane, we see an example of how you not only saved us, but how you have also used us who have no righteousness in ourselves to form your church. Father, it was only your own love and majesty that saved us and made us members of your body. We ask that we would never take these gifts for granted, that we would praise and magnify your name, that we would faithfully use whatever gift we have received to serve others as faithful stewards of your grace. For we ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. It can happen sometimes that when we hear, when we say words uh, again and again, that the power of those words is lost. And so uh, today I'd like to read for you from Romans chapter 8 um, and a combination together of the blending here of the law of God and the pardon for our sin that's found in Christ. And it says this, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit of life set me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, and that it was weakened by the sinful nature, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful man in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the sinful nature, but according to the spirit. Thanks be to God for his love to us. Friends, let us read responsibly now from God's word together. Psalm 131. My heart is not proud, O Lord. My eyes are not haughty. I do not concern myself with great matters or things too wonderful for me. But I have stilled and quieted my soul. Like a weed child with his mother, like a weed child is my soul within me. O Israel, put your hope in the Lord, both now and forevermore. Amen. In the book of Luke, we hear the story about Zacchaeus, who's a man who owed a lot, owed a lot to his, his fellow men, um, certainly um, was someone who transgressed against God. And he comes to Jesus, Jesus um, offers him salvation, and in response, he um, pledges to give back to those that he had taken from, but also gives back to the poor, to people who um, he did not owe anything um, to. And he did this really out of love for what Jesus did to him. Um, because Jesus offered him salvation and gave him salvation, he responded with generosity and with love. And that really is how we should approach this time of our service, the, the tithes and offerings. Um, this can't purchase our salvation. This isn't something that um, we have to do to, to get our salvation. It's not something we can use in any way like that. Um, but as we've just heard, God has offered us salvation through Jesus Christ. Um, that is a tremendous blessing, a tremendous gift. 
And so we should recognize that, we should internalize that, and in response, uh, we should give back um, God's tithes and our offerings with gratefulness right now. Will our deacons come forward? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that you give us the things that we can come back and present to you. We only present a portion of what you give us. But we intend it to be a token of giving ourselves to you. So we would ask that you would use these tokens, our tithes and offerings, for your own glory, but also use us for that same purpose, that you might be glorified, that your name might be known throughout this area, the nation, and even the entire world. Amen. Friends, let us now take joy in confessing together a summary of our faith as found in 1 Timothy 3.16. Beyond all question, the mystery from which true godliness springs is great. God appeared in the flesh, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. And please be seated. Well, it's a great uh, joy and uh, delight today to uh, ordain Craig Lane to the office of deacon. It was interesting that, uh, that, that when uh, Craig's name was first set before the congregation, a number of people said, I thought he was a deacon already. And uh, that's because he has served doing those things uh, for uh, so long. But um, in accordance with our uh, book of church order, Craig and I, uh, met and uh, we looked at the Bible, we looked at theology, we looked at our uh, form of government and um, book of discipline and uh, directory for public worship and um, covered all of those things that were necessary to be uh, covered from the, from the learning standpoint, the theological standpoint, if you uh, will. And then during that time, Craig has been serving uh, with the deacons who uh, also gave a, a hearty endorsement of his uh, work uh, with them. And uh, of course, then when 
uh, the congregation voted to call and it was a unanimous call. So um, we are, uh, we are uh, excited to be able to uh, do that today. And I'm going to ask uh, Craig if he would come and uh, stand here. The Office of Deacon is based upon the kindness and love of Christ for his people. The Lord Jesus is concerned with not only the eternal and spiritual needs of people, but the here and now needs of people. And he considers what is done to the least of his brothers is done to him. He told us that a day is coming when he will say to those who have ministered to the least of these, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you took me in naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. In the beginning, the apostles themselves ministered to those in need, but as the needs grew, in order that they might be able to devote themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word, they committed that responsibility to others, having directed the people to choose men of good report, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom. And since the days of the apostles, the church has recognized the care of those in need and distress as a distinct ministry of the church committed to deacons. The duties of deacons consist of encouraging members of the church to provide for those who are in need, seeking to prevent poverty, making discreet and cheerful distribution to the needy, praying with the distressed and reminding them of the consolations of the Holy Scripture. If they are to fill worthily so sacred an office, deacons must adorn sound doctrine by holy living, setting an example of godliness in all the relations with others. Let them walk with exemplary piety and diligently discharge the obligations of their office. Now, Craig, I uh, put these vows to you before uh, the Lord and before his people. Craig, do you believe the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be the word of God, the only infallible rule of faith and practice? Do you sincerely receive and adopt the confession of faith and catechisms of this church as containing the system of doctrine taught in the Holy Scriptures? Do you approve of the government, discipline, and worship of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church? Do you promise to seek the purity, the peace, and the unity of the church? Do you accept the office of deacon in this congregation and promise in reliance on the grace of God faithfully to, por to perform all the duties of it? And uh, dear congregation of the Lord Jesus, then I put the, this question to you, and you can just signify uh, your assent by raising your right hand. Do you, the members of this church, acknowledge and receive Craig Lane as a deacon and do you promise to yield him all that honor, encouragement, and obedience in the Lord to which his office, according to the word of God and the constitution of our church, entitles him if you do raise your right hand? Going to uh, ask uh, our elders and uh, any other ordained elders and ministers if they would come forward for the ordination. I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Lane if he would kneel and uh, have you brothers come and lay hands on Craig. Lord Jesus, with all of our hearts, we believe that you have called our brother Craig to the office of deacon for which he is today set apart and to which he is ordained through the laying on of our hands. Confident that we have discerned your will, that you've confirmed his call through the affirmation of his fellow deacons, through the elders, and unanimously through the congregation, we ask now that you would fill him with your Holy Spirit and lead and guide him. 
He, like all of us here, have faults and failings, weaknesses and woes. And if perfection were what qualified us to serve you, none of us would or could. Impress upon him and all of us that when you called Peter, you knew his weakness. But his strength to serve you and to grow in grace while doing so came not from himself, but from you being at work in him to will and to do your good pleasure. So as we've seen over the years, the steady formation of Christ and our brother, through the work of this office, may he not only be a blessing to others, but may he also be blessed as he grows both through experiences of joy and sorrow in your work up into the full measure and stature of Christ. To this we commit him as we commit ourselves to the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the love of God, and to the communion of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You can stand up, Craig. I now declare that Craig Lane has been regularly elected, ordained, and installed a deacon in this church agreeably to the word of God and according to the constitution of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, and that he is entitled to all the honor, encouragement, and obedience in the Lord to which his office entitles him. God bless you, Craig. Thank you. If you will turn in your hymnals and if you're able to, to 561 or you can use the bulletin and uh, if you're able to rise and we'll sing together, uh, Lord speak to me that I may speak. So we've got a new deacon, and we're all rejoicing. But, but what exactly does that mean? What on earth is a deacon? What does a deacon do? Um, outside of the church, any ordained ministry is a mystery. If uh, our elders or deacons, if you, if you tell somebody outside the church, well, I'm an ordained elder or an ordained deacon, 
uh, people will not be quite sure what exactly that means. Yesterday at Presbytery, we had lunch with a young pastor there at the church plant in Manassas, and he, he told us that he was reading a book. He was sitting in a, I don't know what, Panera's or Starbucks or something like that, and he was reading a book on the, the mystery of the Trinity, and somebody saw it, and they said, oh, that's interesting. You know, what's that about? And as they got to talking about it, um, the fellow asked him, well, you know, what, what, what do you do? And he said, I'm a pastor. And he said, the guy visibly took a step back because I guess that in this day and age, saying I'm pastor is like saying I'm a leper. <laughs> and maybe it's like that for elders and deacons too, but people are not quite sure exactly what pastors or elders or deacons do. And inside the church, I trust that people have more respect for ordained ministry, a better idea. Um, but, but even for people in the church, oftentimes ordained ministry is a kind of a mystery. And it's not just them. Ordained ministry is sometimes mysterious to the people who are called to those offices. Not so much when serving together in a board of deacons or in a session of elders because you uh, look at things, you examine them, you come to conclusions, you um, plan a course of action, make a determination, carry it out. But it's in those alone times, those times that you think, what should, I, what should I be doing as a deacon? What should I be doing as an elder? What should I be doing as a pastor? And often the ministry can be mysterious. So today I hope to help you move toward solving the mystery. Now, note that I didn't say solve it. I said move it, move you towards solving it because I haven't been able to solve it for myself. But I can point you in the direction. I can tell you the direction to go to solve it. And I want to begin today by reading from 1 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to read from verse 8 through 16. Deacons, likewise, are to be men worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in much wine, and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of the deep truths of the faith with a clear conscience. They must first be tested, and then if there is nothing against them, let them serve as deacons. In the same way, their wives are to be women worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. A deacon must be the husband, but one wife must manage his children and his household well. Those who have served well gain an excellent standing and great assurance in their faith in Christ Jesus. Although I hope to come to you soon, I'm writing you these instructions so that if I'm delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. He appeared in a body, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. And Father, uh, today may the words of my lips and the meditation of Craig's heart and all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O oh God, our rock and our redeemer, through Jesus we pray, amen. So where should we start in trying to solve this mystery of ordained ministry? Well, I think that where, everything, where everyone tends to start is by asking the question, um, what do I do? What's the, what's the job description? It's not unreasonable. Uh, certainly, uh, deacons and elders and pastors have tasks that they carry out. And the word for deacon uh, and the word for serve or service in the New Testament come from the same root. Jesus, in his earthly ministry, did things. He taught, he preached, he healed, he provided for those in need. And so we want to know, what's the job description? Well, if you 
open the Book of Church Order of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, um, it will provide one. There's a job description of what pastors do and what elders do and what deacons do. But, you know, Craig, as you know from your work life, your job description may more or less resemble the things that you actually do. I was talking, and we went to Presbytery yesterday with, uh, with Doug Sane, and I asked him, you know, how do you like your new job? And he said, well, it's different than the job description, right? And that happens sometimes. And, and sometimes people will take their job description, you know, maybe it's happened to you or people that you know, that if it's, if, if it's too different, they'll say, hey, this is not in my job description. I'm not going to do that. This is not my job. Um, Craig, I can tell you after 33 years of pastoral ministry in two churches, um, I've often had to do things that are not in the job description. A common word for Christ's servants in the New Testament is the word doulos. We sanitize that by translating it servant. Bond servant is better. But the word really means slave. And slaves don't have rights. Slaves don't get to say to their master, hey, this isn't my job. And so you may well find yourself doing things that were never anticipated by the book of church orders, job description, because the Holy Spirit speaking through God's word and through your conscience and the circumstances convince you that this is what Jesus is calling you to do at this moment. The office of deacon is a very early office in the church. Paul's letter to the Philippians is written less than 30 years after the resurrection of Jesus. And that letter begins to the saints in Philippi together with the overseers and deacons. And traditionally, the office of deacon is traced back to Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 7. It's worth uh, reading that passage. Uh, Paul, as he, um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Luke, as he's recording these events here, uh, tells us that in those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Grecian Jews among them complained against the uh, Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. And that word, wait on tables, there is literally a verbal form of the word deacon, to deacon. Brothers, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom We'll turn this responsibility over to them, and we will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Procurus, uh, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. And they presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid hands on them, so the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly. And often the uh, deacon's job description is taken from here. It is in our book of church order. And it's said to be a ministry to the poor, to those who are in need. Now, I have no doubt that the Lord Jesus, who had tender compassion and mercy and care for those who were in need during his earthly ministry here, still has it and has provided that through his church. Certainly, care for those in need must be a part of the diaconal task. But if you carefully read what is said here, the text convinces me that it cannot be limited to that because the stated purpose of the establishment of the deacons, while the circumstance was to care for those who were in need, was so that those who were called to the ministry of prayer, the ministry of preaching and teaching the word, would be able to devote themselves to it without distraction. Any ordained ministry will be mysterious if we uh, focus our attention 
on the wrong things about it. And certainly there are tasks for deacons to do, tasks for elders to do, pa- uh, tasks for pastors to do, but God's focus uh, in the passage that I've read today is more on what deacons should be rather than what they should do. And we'll move closer to solving the mystery of ordained ministry if, if you ask, what should I be? In 1 Timothy 3, when Paul tells Timothy to seek out uh, elders, overseers, and deacons, he doesn't give them a list of the things they are to do, their tasks or their jobs, but tells them, uh, tells them what they are to be. And he begins, I'll have you note when he addresses this uh, issue of deacons, he says, deacons likewise. That means that what he said about uh, elders also applies to deacons. In fact, if you read the two uh, groups of things that he says here, there's a, a lot of uh, overlap. But I'll point out something here in the elders that uh, he, doesn't, uh, he doesn't repeat, but I think it, it bears highlighting, uh, and that is the word that it should be somebody who is hospitable. We, we tend to think of uh, hospitality as getting together with friends from church. I hear the word used that way a lot. But that actually fits into the category of fellowship. The word hospitable is the word philozenos, and it literally means a lover of strangers, a lover of people who are not of us or from among us or like us. People's natural inclination is to Uh, like people who are like them and subtly or not so subtly disengage from people who are not like them. It's in fact exactly what happened in Acts chapter 6 with the Grecian Jews. Um, The church was there gathered in Jerusalem in Judea and just to give you a little bit of the the history and setting there that there had been a dispersion of the Jews uh, throughout the Mediterranean and a lot of those Jews who were dispersed Uh, ended up taking on the trappings of the Hellenistic culture in which they lived. The men shaved their beards. They wore uh, Greek clothes, Hellenistic clothes. They might not have been so careful about the dietary restrictions, but in Judea, those Jews were the real Jews. They dressed like Jews. They ate like Jews. They spoke Aramaic instead of Greek. And um, and, and so as, uh, as... as the church there gathers with both uh, Hellenistic Jews and Judaic Jews, the Hellenistic widows are overlooked in the distribution of food. Why? Because they were other. They were different. Now, all of the things that are spoken of here are tasks that flow from traits. Speaks about being worthy of respect, sincere, not known as a guy who likes his drink, not avaricious, generous, not tight-fisted, uh, knowing the deep truths of the faith, really, whole, uh, literally rather, holding the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And perhaps surprisingly, we have in this list qualifications of the deacon's wife. So there's things here that speak to Elizabeth, too. Um, because the, much of what the deacon does is not proprietary. A lot of the elder's work is not delegable. But the, but the deacon's role is unique in that uh, it's things that others in the church can do, but God wants to make sure that they are done. And so there are people set apart to that ministry. But what that means is that the wives of deacons will be involved in, in all likelihood, uh, in their ministry to a higher degree than the wives of elders will be. That's why that focus, I think, is there. And all of these things that he speaks about here, if you go up and look at the, um, the, the characteristics of, uh, of, of an elder, um, 
above reproach, husband of one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, uh, manage his own household well, and then goes on to uh, speak about deacons saying much of the same thing, worthy of respect, sincere, uh, not indulging in much wine, not pursuing dishonest gain, uh, holding the deep truths of the faith, with uh, a clear conscience, uh, et cetera, et cetera, that um, if, if you look at all of uh, these things, these are things that all Christians should strive for. But they must be sufficiently evidenced in those who serve as deacons. And in the judgment of your fellow deacons, in the judgment of the elders, in the judgment of the whole church, you do, and Elizabeth does. You could sum up all of these things that he calls elders and deacons to in their characteristics and their trait uh, under the heading of godliness. And that word is kind of mysterious, right? If, if somebody were to ask you out on the street, are you a godly person? You'd probably choke over that a little bit. Well, I, I hope so, or I endeavor to be. Or the, the word itself means pious or reverent. And it consists in living in a way in which God approves. Uh, consciously striving to reflect the image of God in which you were created and in which you're being recreated in Christ Jesus. So does that solve the mystery of ordained ministry? It hasn't for me. I think you'll be asking from time to time, so, so I'm a deacon, what does that mean? What should I do? And I want to tell you that the answer to that question at any given time will be dictated by the situation you face and the person you are. So the Bible focuses attention on what we're to be. And we could sum it up under this heading of godliness. And, and how do we become godly? Um, are, are there more things we should do or strive for? Or is there something more than that? I, I think, Craig, and let me just remind all of our ordained officers and really the whole congregation that, that you'll move towards solving the mystery by staying close to Jesus. When I was a, when, when I was a, a, a young man, I, I remember you know, looking at these things, and I would enumerate them. And I'd look up the words, and I'd say, you know, this is, this is what elders are to be, and this is what deacons are to be, and, and here's the list, and here's the systematic definition uh, of it. And, you know, the funny thing about lists is that when we uh, make lists of things, um, we, we have a tendency, I do when I make a to-do list, of doing the minimum that I have to do to tick that off my list. I don't think that's God's intention for us here. And, and when I was young, I, I, I never noticed that Paul is not sending this out in a systematic theology uh, as a list, but he's writing it in a letter. He's talking about characteristics, quality, uh, character traits. And then he says this, and, and it's not separate from what he said before. Although I hope to come to you soon, I'm writing you these instructions so that if I am delayed, you will know how people ought to conduct themselves in God's household, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. What people? Well, elders and deacons. That's who he's been talking to them about. Craig, your tasks as a deacon... Will, will vary. There's not a book big enough to contain the things that you might be called upon to do. God is primarily calling you to be something, to be godly, which means to be conformed to Jesus. And Paul here reminds us that we don't become that by keeping a list of rules. If, if we could, then Saul of Tarsus, uh, the Apostle Paul, could have just stayed a Pharisee. 
if that was the way to gain righteousness, Paul said, then he's got a resume and a list and Christ died needlessly. And Paul reminds us here that we become godly not by keeping lists of things, although reviewing these things from time to time is not a bad idea. I'd commend it to you. But he goes on to say, we confessed it today. Beyond all question, the mystery of godliness is great. See, he introduces another mystery, a mystery of godliness. What does it mean to be godly? And you'd think that what he was going to do then was to, was to tell us the things that we should do or to be or to give us a list, but no, he doesn't do that. He says he appeared in a body, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations, was believed on in the world, was taken up in glory. In other words, what Paul does is he summarizes the gospel. And he says that's the mystery of godliness. That's where, godly, where godliness is to be found, that we don't become godly by making lists of rules and keeping them. If, if we could do that, I say again in Paul's words, that Christ died needlessly. We do it by the gospel. And the mystery of godliness is that we attain it, we attain godliness by Jesus and by what he has done. Godliness is found in Christ, and you grow in it by being close to him. So you'll ask yourself from time to time, I know you will because you're conscientious, I've known you for many, many years. So I'm a deacon, what am I supposed to be doing? And, and at times it will be mysterious, at times you'll say, I'm not, I don't really know, it doesn't seem clear. But the answer to that question will lie in knowing that you're a bondservant of Jesus, a slave of Jesus. And the situation will dictate the need, and the right response will come through godliness of character. And that is developed not by a pedantic study of theology. I say it again, uh, the Apostle Paul said, if, if that could save me, it would have nor the legalistic keeping of lists. It's developed by walking day by day with Jesus, by staying close to Jesus, by being uh, open-hearted deliberately with Jesus. Throughout church history, there have been uh, times that we've seen horrific injustices and evils committed in God's name, in Christ's name. People will sometimes like to throw those up as an objection to the Christian faith. I'm never bothered when people do that. I'm not, I can't say that I'm happy to admit that those things are true, but, but I'm willing to admit that those things are true. But the problem was never with Christ. The problem was with Christians. It ought not to be, but sometimes it has been. What's the cause of that? I, I think the cause of that goes back to this, and I've reflected on this a lot in my own life and ministry as I've, as I've looked at this passage something that I've discovered over, over three decades of ministry, uh, and I've often pondered it through these words. And, and so, Craig, if you take nothing else away today uh, from what I've told you, take this. It's dangerous for the servants of God to get far from Jesus. The further people get from Jesus, the more they'll try to use him for their purposes. But the closer you get to Jesus, the more he will be able to use you for his. And if you want to move towards solving the mystery of what you're supposed to be doing as a deacon, stay close to Jesus. Our confession of faith tells us that the 
Lord's Supper is a bond and pledge of the servants of God, uh, not only um, in their relationship with their Lord, but in their relationship and fellowship with one another. I, I can't think of a better time than on uh, a day when we've had an ordination and are going to be celebrating our wonderful mothers in the, uh, in the, in the fellowship dinner coming up that we observe the Lord's table together. And so I'm going to ask our elders if they would come to distribute the elements of this supper. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. The same way after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let one examine himself, herself. So let them eat of the bread and drink of the cup. Michael Blackburn, can I ask you to give thanks for the bread and the body of Christ given for us?
Jesus took the bread when he'd given thanks. He broke it. He gave it to his disciples. And he said, take, eat, this is my body. After supper, Jesus took the cup. Doug, say, would you give thanks for the cup and the blood of Christ shed to uh, reconcile us to God? Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, both bringing before you with our understanding of whom we thank you. Mm. You give it to us free, Lord, and yet you do deliver to us. We praise you for your mercy. After supper, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for many. Drink it. It's certainly fitting that after we consider God's grace to us that we take opportunity to be the vehicles of his grace to others. We do that through the benevolent fund that's uh, taken for the distribution by our deacons to those who are in need, both inside and outside the church. And so I want to encourage you to uh, give generously to that.
Would you stand for prayer? Our Father, we thank you for your grace, which is great to us. Thank you today for uh, our brother Craig, who's been among us for a long time, has been a, a friend uh, to all of us for so long. We rejoice with him today in the confirmation of this calling that you placed upon his life. We pray that you'd bless him greatly in it. And Father, these things that have been given today, uh, now as he participates in the distribution of those things, we pray that you would give him uh, wisdom and grace, uh, generosity and winsomeness in reflecting the Lord Jesus and uh, Father, we pray that your blessing would be upon all of us. Again, we ask for your blessing upon our moms as we celebrate them in the dinner to come today. Thank you for this wonderful day you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. As we conclude our worship, um, if you'll turn in your bulletin or in your black hymnal to number four, and we'll sing together, All I Have is Christ. God's been so good to us. 
Now uh, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all today and forever. Amen. <laughs>